I want to pause here and I want to say this. Think about your own life, right? As a Christian. Think about all the things that you struggle with, the sins, the issues, the emotional problems, whatever the case may be, that you struggle with, that I struggle with. Take that category and then put it against what you know in Scripture Jesus calls us to. For instance, he calls us not to be selfish, to not to be greedy, to turn the other cheek, to lay down our life for one another, to, to lay down our lives and pick up his cross, right? How many times in your life do you find yourself in a position where you are trying to overcome sin, overcome certain things, but somehow at the end of the day, never seem to overcome something? Well, my suggestion to you and what I think the biggest takeaway that we're going to see here in taking part in these spiritual disciplines that Jesus himself, who was different, who did complete all those things, is that when we practice and we do the things that Jesus did, we will see victory and actual change in our lives. Okay? When I wrote here, these work in tandem with the Holy Spirit. A lot of times we think that we're going to pray about something and it's going to go away. We think we're going to pray and ask the Holy Spirit, God, change this desire, change this. But then we don't change anything in our lives and we expect for some reason something to change. Nothing does. And then we get frustrated and we fall into the same cycle. Why? Well, it's because it's not just the Holy Spirit. Yes, that's the main driving factor. He's the one who changes us. But it's also your actions in part with that. Okay? So it's both and. Okay, so where do spiritual disciplines fit, okay? This, if you didn't know, this is a little bit of a theology lesson. I don't know if we covered this in the discipleship class, but this right here on the top of the screen, this is the journey of every single believer, okay? So the first stage is salvation. That's immediately followed by justification, then sanctification, and then glorification, Okay, I'm going to go through each one of these. I'm going to go through each one of these and I'm going to read them out loud. And we're going to, I want you to be thinking about that question. Where do they fit? So where do spiritual disciplines fit in each one of these categories? All right. So I'm going to read them and talk about them for a second. Um, and then we will uh, kind of figure out, okay, I'm going to ask you guys, where do you think spiritual disciplines belong in this journey, in our journey as believers, okay? So, the first one, salvation. Salvation is the saving of one's soul from eternal damnation in exchange for everlasting life. And this is found in Romans 6.23, among many other places in Scripture. Salvation, the moment that you first believe, the moment you accepted Jesus Christ to your heart, you were what? Saved, right? Immediately, as soon as you are saved, it's preceded by something called justification, okay? Justification is a legal act of God whereby he pronounces a sinner to be righteous because of the sinner's faith in Christ. This is found in Ephesians 2, 1 through 4, among many other places in Scripture. What is justification in simpler terms? It's when God looks at you, and because you said, I believe in you, God, even though you are a sinner, even though you will mess up in the future and you have messed up, God says, I declare you clean before me. And because you are clean, you now have the opportunity to have everlasting life and eventually stand before me. It's a legal declaration by God alone saying you are justified. All right. Number two, number three, sanctification. This is the one that you and I are partaking in right now. The lifelong process in which a believer is set apart from the world and becomes more and more holy through the power of the Holy Spirit. 2 Peter 3.18 This is a continual, ongoing process that the Holy Spirit begins in us from the moment of salvation after we're justified we are sealed by the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit begins to show you sin in your life, give you conviction, lead you to compassion rather than hate, lead you to be selfless instead of selfish, 
These, this is the lifelong journey of the believer. Sanctification, becoming more like Christ, okay? And the Holy Spirit is the one that changes our hearts over time. And the final part is glorification. God's final removal of sin, pain, and suffering from a believer's life so that they may be able to stand before him for all eternity. Romans 8.18. Basically, this is what happens when you die or he comes. Glorification. This is when you pass away. And because of the, la the first three things, God now says, you have passed from that life to the next and you are forever free from all sin, pain, and you can stand before me in my throne. All right, glorification. So now that we've gone through the journey of the believer, which one do you think spiritual disciplines have a place in? Anybody? Julius? Justification. Why justification? Explain that a little bit more. Oh, no. Okay, D'Angelo? Sanctification. sanctification. That's correct. Sanctification. So, why in sanctification? One, we establish that spiritual disciplines work in tandem with the Spirit. And if the Spirit of God is the one sanctifying us, then that means there must also be something that we have to contribute to our own holiness, to our own process of becoming holy. Pardon me, all right? So, it's in sanctification. I want to talk about this and I want to digest this a little bit. And this is something that I think is really cool. Because like I said, can anyone tell me when I mentioned the word flesh, okay, I said there are two avenues that flesh can be used. One is not action, yes, but two basic words. And they're opposites of each other. Good and bad, okay? Here understanding that, that there's good and bad, and like you said, Lydia, that there's action. When he talks about the flesh, it means doing something. I want us to read this very famous verse, a couple of verses in Galatians 5, that if you look in your Bibles, you'll see it titled, Life by the Spirit, or Life through the Spirit. But I want you to see how the theology of the Bible, the biblical theology, actually presents a balance between the Spirit's work in our lives, and your ability to do something as well, okay? For my little color coding here, black, bold black is going to be both. Blue is the flesh, and red is the spirit, all right? Okay, so let's go through this really quickly. Galatians 5, 13 through 19, how does the Holy Spirit and spiritual disciplines work together? So, uh, D'Angelo, can I have you read verse 13, please? You, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free from all right, so in that first verse, we see a couple things. You, my brothers and sister, were called. <coughs> Somebody yell it out. What is, which part of the Trinity draws you to the Father? The Spirit of God. It's highlighted in red. The Spirit is the one that calls you, right? Draws you to the things of God. To be, what? What's that first word? Free. Now, that word freedom is in relation to two things. Physical freedom, which means you can literally do anything you want. Okay? You have been, through the Spirit of God, been given freedom to make any choice you want. But you also have been given spiritual freedom. And this is important. Why? Because where there's physical freedom to do anything... To choose, prior to Christ, you are a slave to sin, which means you do not have the power, apart from the Holy Spirit, to choose good. But because you were called, and you've been made free physically, you've been made free spiritually, right? Which means now you have the freedom to do what you were not able to do, which is choose Christ. Choose good. It's both and. So this is a physical freedom with an added spiritual freedom, okay? Then it says, but do not use your freedom, once again, both physical and spiritual, to indulge in the flesh. What does indulge in the flesh mean? To dive into 
Exactly. The word indulge there actually means to complete. What this is saying is the spiritual freedom, the physical freedom that you've gotten, you have a responsibility and you have a choice. Do you physically, literally, literally with your body, as we've established, indulge, take part in, do, act according to what, what your flesh, your body <laughs> wants to do? Or rather, serve, literally meaning, if there is a plate of food here and Andrea is hungry and we're here and we're eating at church and she asks her food, it literally means, let me serve, let me act, let me serve somebody else. Physically speaking, this isn't some super deep spiritual thing. A lot of times we read it as this big spiritual thing. Live by the Spirit, walk by the Spirit, serve each other, love each other. Yes, the Holy Spirit is one that calls us there. Yes, He gives us the freedom. He makes us free to do those things. But also, literally, physically, submit your body to serving and loving. All right, Guzman, if you can read verses 14 and 15, I would love that. Can you see it? All right, I'll read it out loud for this one. For the entire law is fulfilled in keeping this one command. Love your neighbor as yourself. If you bite and devour each other, watch out or you will be destroyed by each other. Very simple kind of section here. There's a lot of action, a lot of flesh, a lot of choosing in this section. Love your neighbor as yourself. But if you bite and devour each other, watch out for you will be destroyed by each other. What he's saying is this. Loving is an action. You have to physically love. Submit to the love of Christ and love one another. The opposite of that is to be selfish, to bite and devour, to literally harm someone, not physically per se, although it could mean that, but more in a more emotional sense. What I'm trying to establish here is that this is very practical, right? Not everything in Scripture is this big spiritual, like, kind of confusing thing. No, this is literally saying you've been given the spirit of God, so then do the right thing that you can because of the freedom. Verse 16, uh, Julius, can you read verse 16 through 17? Yes. So I say, walk by the spirit, and you will not gratify the desire of the flesh. Can you read 17 as well? Oh, sorry. For the flesh desires, desires what is... Contrary. Contrary to the spirit. And the spirit, and the spirit, and the spirit, what is contrary to the flesh. They are, they are in conflict, conflict with each other so that you are not to do whatever you want. And verse 18 says, but if you are led by the spirit, you are not under the law. I'm going to summarize this one. There's a lot of both and in this part, okay? So I say walk by the Spirit. Okay, we see the supernatural Spirit of God. We see the supernatural Spirit of God right here next to the word walk by the Spirit. Based on what we're talking about, you don't have to answer out loud, but what do you think that means, right? Walk by the Spirit. Live your life. Do the things of Christ. Do the things that the Spirit calls us to do. That's all it's saying. Walk by the Spirit. It's D'Angelo, it's Chris Guzman, it's any of us, it's me using my legs, using my hands and feet, deciding what I'm watching, deciding what I'm watching, what I'm listening to, and measuring that up to the things of the Spirit. And then it says, so if you walk by the Spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh, for the flesh desires what is contrary to the Spirit. So there's this battle, right? Right? There's this battle. Now it's talking about the evil side of the flesh, the selfish desires, the desires that we have that go against Christ. It's talking about the dichotomy between the two. And it says they are in conflict with each other so that you are not to do whatever you want. But if you are led by the Spirit, once again, we see something similar like in the first verse. It says walk by the Spirit. Now it says be led by the Spirit. What do you think this means? You follow, you do, you do the things of the spirit. It's not, and this is a very practical thing that I've done before I even, I learned about these things is I used to say, Lord, God, help me not be selfish. Lord, help me not be, or get angry or be annoyed. And then you pray these things. And yes, there's that moment, right? Where let's say, 
um, someone comes to me and does something that's very annoying, and I have the opportunity, okay, do I react in annoyment or do I not and react in love? The Spirit is the one that gives me the opportunity to react in love. So that's the Spirit, the desires there. The Spirit has given me that. Why? Because I prayed for it. But then I have to physically decide, will I do it or will I not? That's what it means to walk by the Spirit and led by the Spirit. So once again, the Holy Spirit and our actions, spiritual disciplines work together through sanctification and it's a both and, right? That's what I wrote down here. Spiritual disciplines are avenues where we meet and submit our literal bodies to create space for and engage with the Holy Spirit, with, what the, with the work the Holy Spirit is accomplishing in our lives. It's both and and not either or, all right? That's the basis for this. And this is huge because I'm going to speak about some things in a little bit that are very simple if you look at them just by words or an explanation. And you may be like, how the heck is that going to change me? Well, the thing is, the power isn't necessarily in the thing. The power is in you submitting yourself to the thing that Jesus exemplified and that meets in the middle with the Holy Spirit. And when you submit your actions... To the work of the Spirit, you actually change, right? Because sanctification is what? Becoming more holy, becoming more like Christ. Think about, once again, how many of you in this room are in a place in your walk with Christ where you don't want to be in anymore? You've been reacting the same way. You've been thinking the same things. You've been watching the same things. You've been doing the same things that you've been trying to change for months, for months, for months, for years, for years, for years. And you're like, why am I not changing? It ain't the Holy Spirit. He's not lazy. He's not. It's our actions as believers partnering with that that eventually changes. All right? Okay. So, we're going to go to the actual list of the disciplines. So, we're going to get into it. This is kind of part two of today. Okay? You don't have to write these down. There's a ton of them. I'm going to explain these throughout the weeks. Um, So, this is not uh, a necessarily, you have to write them. If you do, and take a photo, whatever, zoom in and write them down. I would love for you to, but I'm going to list them off. If you'd like to write them out that way, um, then we can do that as well. But Dallas Willard highlights these disciplines in two different areas, okay? One, the first column is the disciplines of abstinence, and the second column is disciplines of engagement, all right? So I'll read each list. The disciplines of abstinence, which are the ones we're going to cover, or at least most of them in this class, are solitude, silence, fasting, sacrifice, Sabbath, frugality, vigil, and chastity. The disciplines of engagement are study, worship, celebration, service, prayer, fellowship, confession, and submission, all right? These are the bigger ones that we see in Scripture. Now, throughout church history, a lot of early church fathers and early church monks, they added their own and they implemented some things which are actually really good spiritual things that do actually enhance, but they're not necessarily the big ones. These are the big ones we see in Scripture, all right? So, This is week one of this class. And this is a class which means there's going to be homework, okay? Which means we are going to do stuff, which means this is going to be practical. Because what's the point of me talking about spiritual disciplines if you're not going to do the spiritual disciplines, right? So this is how the format's going to be run. If you just want to pay attention to me real quick before we kind of go into this page here. This week, I'm going to give you two disciplines, all right? And you have about six days till next Wednesday to take a portion of your day, and we'll go into the specificities of that as I talk about them. It could be on Tuesday of next week. It could be on Saturday. It could be after church on Sunday, right? I want you to take two moments, one moment per discipline, to practice the discipline, right? Some weeks, there may be four disciplines, And you have six days to complete four. 
A discipline doesn't take a whole day. It can take an hour. It can take 30 minutes. It can take two hours. It can take a whole day if you want to. We'll get to that as we talk about that. But we're going to start with week one being two disciplines from the disciplines of abstinence. Then next week, it's going to be the disciplines of engagement, then abstinence, then engagement. All right? Some we're going to do together. Some we're not. It's going to be really cool. All right? So this is week one, which means we're going to start in abstinence. What are the goals of the disciplines of abstinence? The goal is to abstain from fleshly lusts which war against the soul. This is found in 1 Peter 2.11. All right? The disciplines of abstinence are practices, and this is key. This is key here to understanding these disciplines. They make room to realign oneself underneath the sovereignty of God by removing oneself from the ordinary and extraordinary facets of this world. What I mean is this. When we say abstain, it means this. It can mean simply abstain from time with your friends and family. That's something normal, something that's good. Or something that's extraordinary is if Instagram if is, is taking too much of your time and you're falling into sin, that may be something a little bit that we would consider bad, it's also abstaining from that. So it's abstaining from things that, yes, are good, but also things that are bad. Why? Because when we pull away, when we abstain from the things of this world, we now have an opportunity to realign ourselves underneath Christ, okay? Jesus himself regularly withdrew and removed himself from the practicalities of this world to realign his heart with his fathers. If Jesus did it, then what makes us think that we can't do it? Right? Or that we don't have to do it. It doesn't matter what your schedule is. Jesus was probably the busiest man who's ever lived. This man gave probably like three sermons every single day and was doing miracles and was walked, let alone, they didn't have cars. They didn't ride horses. They didn't ride camels. They walked everywhere. This man went all over the Middle East on his two legs for three years, doing this, this, and that, being attacked, being mocked, went through the whole crucifixion thing, then came back, did even more, and still managed to apply and do these practices of abstinence that for us in a culture where we're so busy, feel like we cannot, which may be a very valid feeling, but the reality is you have to make time. You have to. There is no exception. That's why you don't see change. Because Jesus made the change because he chose, I will do this even though it's going to interrupt my schedule. Even though my father's going to tell me to do this. I have to. If Jesus had to, we have to. There's, if he's the bar, then we got to meet the bar. If we don't meet the bar, we miss the bar. And if we miss the bar, we mess ourselves up. This is from the book. Dallas Willard is a great quote. If we feel that any habit or pursuit harmless in itself is keeping us from God and seeking us deeper into the things of this earth, then abstinence is our only course. If there's anything that's good and bad that you are partaking in that is taking you away from time with Christ, becoming more like Christ, being the believer that God has called you to believe, you have to abstain. That is the only way you will change. And that's what disciplines of abstinence are. Do we understand that? Are there any questions about that? Because that's what we're talking about this week, all right? Into the practicalities of this. Number one, the first one we're going to put into practice this week, solitude, okay? Solitude. What is solitude? Solitude is the intentional avoidance of interacting with others. So if you're an introvert, which I don't think many people in this room are, that will be very easy for you. If you're an extrovert, they may be very hard for you. Solitude is you choosing, in a very practical sense, it's Julius asking me to hang out and say, I can't hang out with you, I'm going to be alone for the next X amount of time. That's what it looks like and sounds like. Let's look, we're going to look about this more, but just to bring it up, what did Jesus do? Jesus always left. 
he would withdraw. He would do a miracle. He would perform. He would speak. And then where it was, he was found by himself somewhere praying to God, spending time alone. Solitude. Intentional avoidance. It's denying oneself of companionship and any thoughts, emotions, or actions that come with interaction. Because it's not, it's not about saying that like, okay, my interaction with my brother is bad. No, it's a good thing. But it's that me being with D'Angelo, not only am I spending, is my time being spent with him, which is a good thing, but also there's thoughts, there's emotions, there's things that happen in a relationship, in a friendship that are good things, but at the end of the day, they're not Christ. The point of this is to abstain from those things, even though they may be good. Number three, it's choosing to be alone so that one can dwell on that solitude alone experience with Christ. It's not just I'm being alone. It's I'm being alone with Christ. There's a big difference. And the fourth one, solitude. This is huge. This is huge, guys. I would love for you to write this one down. Solitude frees us from the need presented by this world to be busy in exchange to be realigned with God's order. The thing is this, the world has created an order. It's established routines of it's cool to be busy. We need to be busy. We need to do this. We need to do that. I have to be on my phone. I got to check this post. I got to get this job. I got to meet this person here. I said yes to this commitment, so I have to go, 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 go. When if you look at the life of Jesus, if you look at the life of God, the creator, he said, after seven days, I'm out. I'm taking a rest day. Right? Solitude is taking an intentional moment to realign yourself with, does God even want me to say yes to these things? Are these friendships benefiting me? Is, are these three jobs, this job that I'm pursuing, is this what's best for me? In this moment? You don't even know because you haven't taken the time to be alone with Christ. Solitude, all right? This is a quote from Dallas Willard. The normal chorus of day-to-day -day human interactions locks us into patterns of feelings, thought, and actions that are geared to a world sent against God. What is this saying? What's something that's good in the world? So let's say, give me a hobby. Give me a hobby. Any hobby. You said baseball? You said reading? All right. Is reading bad? Yes or no? Is baseball bad? Yes or no? But at the end of the day, let's take baseball for example. Is baseball bad? No. We've established it's good. But it's tethered to what? This planet. It's a good thing that stems from this world. And if we know the overarching theology in the Bible of the world, of the issues of the life we live in, we know that even though there are many good things in this world, there are things that are God-inspired and God-created. Yes, 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 yes. Enjoy those. And we'll get to that when we talk about celebration. But there are good things and especially bad things that are rooted in this world. And we want to detach from that to plug back into Christ. All right? And before I go into the next one, how do we do this? How do we do that? How do we practice solitude? I'll tell you. And we'll go more into detail. It literally means, for some people, it's going to be different. You may only have 30 minutes on a Saturday to do this. You may have an hour on a Monday. You may have two hours in the afternoon. You may have 15 minutes when you wake up. How do you practice solitude? You go somewhere alone. It's pretty simple. And you say, God, I'm here with you. No one else is here with me. And the point isn't to hear God's voice. It's not a time of prayer where you're asking God, Lord, speak to me. I'm alone now. No. It's you learning what it looks like and to be okay with being alone. Think about that. How many of us have an issue, per se, being alone? If you're an introvert, you're chilling and you love to be alone. But the difference between an introvert who likes to be alone in solitude is that an introvert likes to be alone to please themselves. 
Solitude is rejecting the self part of it and saying, I'm doing this for my betterment and saying, I'm doing this with Christ. And it's sitting alone by yourself. Go for a walk in the woods. Go in your room and say to your family, I'm by myself. Don't talk to me for 15 minutes. Go on a car ride by yourself and say, God, it's simple. It's literally closing the door and saying, God, I'm here with you and I'm alone. And learn to be okay with that. And watch in the removal of things to do, watch God give you visions. Watch him speak to you. Watch him minister to you. Watch him change your heart. But it's not going in saying like, God, I want you to speak to me about X. No, just be alone with him. Be alone. That's solitude. The second one that we're going to practice this week is silence. And these two go together. A lot of times you hear theologians talk about silence and solitude as kind of one thing, okay? Silence. What is the discipline of silence? Silence is when we close ourselves off from sound. Silence makes solitude, what we just talked about, a reality, okay? They go hand in hand. Silence truly provides an opportunity to make it just you and God. By stripping oneself of all external noise encountered in our daily lives, one's thoughts are left against the backboard of Christ and are exposed and then vulnerable to change. This is where the change happens, right? What is silence? It's going somewhere with no music, no voices, no nothing. A lot of times we like to go... I don't know if this is anybody. Who likes to spend time with the Lord with music on? Maybe worship music on or whatever. Like, that's a pretty normal thing. But silence is not only being alone, but it's being alone in silence with Christ. I love this quote that Dallas Willard here says. Let's read it together. It says this. And in that quiet, this is talking about the very simple nature of this discipline. It's not some, like I said, God isn't going to necessarily, the goal isn't to ask God, give me this vision from you. It's very simple. And that's what Dallas Willard is going to say here. And in that quiet, what if there turns out to be very little to just us and God? What if there's just that? It's, there's nothing more. It's just me with God in silence. Think what it says about the inward emptiness of our lives. If we must always turn on the tape player or radio to make sure something is happening around us. We are addicted to interaction. Forget your phones. We all know we're addicted to our phones. That's not an issue, right? We all know Facebook, Instagram. We all know we're addicted to those things. But also think about it. You're addicted to, if you don't have Instagram on your phone, you're dying to talk to somebody. You're dying to go make food. You're dying to listen to music. You're dying to go read a book. You're dying to go for... We're addicted to interaction. We're addicted to sights and sounds. What silence allows us to is to not only be alone in solitude, but pull away... Think about it this way. If I call my brother's name, if I say, D'Angelo, what's going to happen in his brain? Not only is D'Angelo going to hear my voice, his mind is also going to begin to figure out why am I calling him. He's going to decide whether or not he wants to come. He's going to think about X, Y, and Z. All these things come with just sound. Scientists actually say when someone's dying and someone dies, their ability to hear is one of the last things that fades away. After sight, after feeling, it's the ability for the brain to process sound. What is silence? Silence is stripping us away from the noise of the world to be alone, to just be with Christ, and to hear him. All right? That's what silence is. Why are we doing this? I talked about this in the beginning. I said pay attention to this thread. Okay, why are we talking about silence and solitude? Why are we talking about these disciplines in the first place? Through partaking in these disciplines, in these spiritual disciplines, you and I can actually partake in the way of Jesus. We can partake in how Jesus lived his life. That's why we're doing this, to be more like Jesus. 
Jesus himself was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, Matthew 4.1. He went out to a, des- a desolate place, Mark 1.35 and Luke 4.42, and went up to the mountain to be by himself to pray alone, Matthew 14.23. These are things Jesus did regularly. And he was the Son of God, God incarnate. You would think he wouldn't need a rest day, but Jesus needed a rest day. Jesus needed 20 minutes alone, away from people, with no sights or sounds before him, to realign himself. I think about the story of him in the garden before the crucifixion. I spoke about that a couple weeks ago on Sunday. We talked about Father's Day, right? Jesus was able to hear the will of the Father so clearly. And it was something so excruciating to literally go on a cross and die. He was able to hear that so clearly and also hear that the Lord, that his father God wanted him to do that more than that. There was no other option. He got that clearly from his father, clearly from his father. How was he able to do that? If you read the story, it says this. He took his disciples into the garden and then he said, you guys stay here and pray. And then it says, Jesus went on a little bit farther by himself and prayed. Then he went back, his disciples were asleep, and he said, get up, pray that lest you fall into the temptation. He left them there, and then he went back, he said, then he went a little bit farther by himself and prayed with his father. And that's when God said, this is what you got to do. And he said, Lord, if it's your will, take this cup from me, but God, your will, not mine. He was alone by himself in the dead of night with no one to see, with nothing to hear. Silence and solitude. This is why we're doing this, guys, because there's change that needs to happen in your life, in my life, that we've been relying on past practices, past ideas, what we think is supposed to happen. Um, But in reality, it's something as simple as partaking in these disciplines and partnering with the Spirit of God wants to do in us, all right? So this week, what do I want us to do? We have... Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, and then Wednesday before class next week. We have seven days. In those seven days, my challenge to you is this. Take two moments out of just two moments for, let's say, someone like D'Angelo who's like at home. He has more free time. He can spend an hour, two hours. Or, but then we have someone like Lily, who may have a job, right? Who maybe can't take two hours out of her day to be alone and quiet, but can take maybe 15 minutes in the morning. What I want you to do is take two moments where you will practice both silence and solitude at the same time, okay? Get somewhere where you can be alone by yourself with no sounds. Obviously, if you're outside somewhere, you can't control cars. That's not a big deal. That's not what we're worrying about. We're worrying about sounds that we can control, okay? And I want you to experience it. I want you to do it. And once again, what does it look like? Let me run it through you very practically. Okay, I'm Nestor Gomez. It's Monday morning, and I want to do science and solitude. For me, what I'm going to do probably is I'm going to wake up early, and I'm going to go walk somewhere by myself. Okay? I get to the place I want to walk, and this is what I say. Lord, I give you this time where I'm by myself. I'm not going to play music. I'm not going to speak. I'm not going to necessarily speak to anybody. I'm just going to walk with you. And you do what you want to do. You minister to me the way you want to minister to me. And then I'm going to walk for 30 minutes. And I'm going to go back to my car and go home and continue on the rest of my day. Now, what I want you to be doing is I want you to analyze. Does the Lord put a Bible verse in your head? Does the Lord speak to you about a topic? Does he give you an idea? Or maybe he doesn't. Maybe it's just dead quiet. But what I want to warn you is this, especially for the overthinkers in the room. (laughs) Two things will happen. One, you will try and finagle something to happen. You will try and, like, ask God something, and you will try and get some sort of whatever because you feel like nothing's happening. The point, once again, isn't to get something from God. It's to be with God. And when you be with God is when you're changed. The second thing is this. You may not interact and like ask God or talk to God or try and make something happen, but this is what's going to happen. 
your worst thoughts will probably come up. So the things that you're annoyed about, the things that you deal with, the stresses on your mind, da -da 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 -da, those things will come up. And I spoke about that here on the last part. It says, by stripping oneself from all the external noise encountered in daily life, one's thoughts are left against the backboard of Christ, exposed and vulnerable to change. That is a good thing. If those thoughts begin to come, then what you do is continue doing that. You just continue to walk in silence with the Lord. You've given that time to Christ. Christ is sovereign. Satan isn't going to take over your brain. Christ is in charge. And you may not leave that differently. You may not leave that time differently. That's not the point. The point is this. Jesus did that for three years on earth. And he went through his arc of progression that you read in scripture. It may take you a year, two years, three years to make these things habits and also see the change. The Christian life what did we talk about sanctification? It's a how long practice? It's a life long. It's a lifelong thing of sanctification. It's going to take time. You may not see a change per se, doing it one time in the next seven days. But if you want to and you want to do, let me take 15 minutes each day for seven days or 15 minutes for three days and do silence and solitude, you may begin to notice something. The more you put it into practice, and the goal of this is to put it into practice, make this a normal part of your week, a normal part of your month, where you take a couple of days and you practice silence and solitude, among the other ones we will discuss in this class. That's when you, you will begin to see the change, all right? So don't freak out if you don't feel better at the end of 15 minutes of being alone and being in quiet. What you have to trust is you did what Jesus did, which means there's power on that. The Spirit wants to change you, so if you're partnering with the Spirit, something good's going to happen. Something good's going to happen, all right?